Prabhupada was in L.A. for about six months in 1970. And he was working on two books. He was working on the Krishna book and the um, Nectar of Devotion. And I had the great good fortune to be first coming as a guest and then I moved into the Laguna Beach Temple and we used to come up every, Prabhupada would speak Monday night, so we would come up Monday night. So these are just a couple of events from that. At, when I was coming as a guest, and someone's going to have to remind me about the time, because I'm sure you will. <laughs> You're hovering like the Grim Reaper right over there. The, um, I was a guest and I didn't know much about Krishna consciousness. I was reading Bhagavad Gita, but I had my own Shanti Shanti ideas. And the temple room used to be over here where the museum is now. And the ladies were sitting on one side, men on the other, and Prabhupada's Vyasa on here. And he spoke and asked for questions at the end of his talk. And some we would say homeless now, but some disheveled, as Prabhupada would say, not quite in order. This guy stood up, and he was a big guy, and uh, matted hair and angry, and, and he became lumbering right up the aisle towards Prabhupada. He's, oh, and it happened so fast that everyone was like, nobody moved. And he got about as close to the Vyasasan as this, you know, front row here. And Prabhupada went, stop! And the guy just stopped. And then Prabhupada pointed to Brahmananda and said, do you see this man? And it was just like the movies. Whoosh, everybody looked at Brahmananda. Whoosh, they looked back at the guy. And Prabhupada said, do you see this man? And Prabhupada said, if I tell him to... He will kill you. <laughs> and the guy sat right down and Prabhupada went on talking like nothing had happened. <laughs> and I thought, this personality is transcendental. This is, you know, it was, Prabhupada was so detached and dealt with it so efficiently and succinctly and then was totally unfazed like nothing had happened. So that was one of my first experiences with Srila Prabhupada. This used to be uh, a sanctuary, um, and by that it, there were seats, and then there was the uh, uh, an organ, a big where the, where the Shinga sons are now was a big big organ pipes, and right in this corner was a pulpit, like a you know the old pulpit, and Prabhupada had him put a seat, and Prabhupada would sit cross-legged in the pulpit. And I mean, he would click on the light. You remember, he would click on the light and he would give Bhagavatam city, you know, right, you know. So one day, Prabhupada came down. And I don't know the setup. I was just, you know, sitting over here. And Vishnu John said, Prabhupada, it's an organ. It's like a harmonium. It's a big organ. And Prabhupada sat down at the organ and, began, and Prabhupada said, this is the morning tune. And with one hand on the organ, he began playing samsara dava nalalila, like that. And Vishnu Jan Maharaj, because he was a brahmachari at the time, but very intelligent how to get nectar, said, Prabhupada, there's foot pedals. And Vishnu Jan Maharaj got down on all fours and was moving Prabhupada's feet from pedal to pedal. <laughs> so you had Prabhupada sitting at this organ playing the morning program and Vishnu Jan Maharaj, and it was... If there could have been wings on this building, like the cartoon movies, you would, they would have been floating up Prabhupada led this kirtan, you know? So that was another experience. Um, he used to, Krishna book just came. Prabhupada, oh, this is, one time I was uh, deployed into the labor team, or the you know, service team. They were going to repaint Prabhupada's room. And they thought Prabhupada was sitting in the garden. So Karandar was in charge, and I was there with a couple other brahmacharis. And, you know, we all came in overalls with paint and stumbled into Prabhupada's room. 
and Prabhu was sitting behind his desk. And everyone offered their obeisances, and Prabhu had a gardenia garland wrapped around his head about five times. So after offering obeisances, Karandar asked Prabhu, why do you have the garland around your head? Prabhu said, very good for headaches. <laughs> Prabhu used to come and sit out in the garden out here, and where the gift shop is now used to be the Brahmacharya ashram. And you could lean out the windows and hear Prabhupada, what he was talking to, you know, about. And Prabhupada was meeting with the, you know, the chairman of the, you know, the UCLA, you know, religions department or some local city councilman or big donor. I mean, Prabhupada was meeting, you know, materially Kali Yuga, so-called cultured, qualified people. And you had about 30 brahmacharis hanging out the windows. It looked like a barrel of monkeys. You know, we're all, you, maybe you remember, Shruti. You could lean out, and the other brahmachari would hold the back of your dhoti, so you could lean out, and then we'd take turns. So you can imagine, it was like a circus, right? And then, Karun, not Karunder, uh, Keshava said to us, Keshava said, you know, it's embarrassing. Prabhupada's meeting these distinguished people, and we've got you guys hanging out there like a bunch of monkeys, you know, and... You shouldn't do it anymore. And, you know, we were heartbroken because, you know, we were hearing Prabhupada speaking so profoundly and sweetly. And, but we thought, he's right, you know. We just, you know, here's our spiritual master. He's doing important preaching and we shouldn't be self-centered. So we, that day, we weren't there. Prabhupada came, sat down, a bunch of scholars sitting in front of him. Prabhupada looked up, said, where are the brahmacharis? He said, go and get them. <laughs> so Keshava had to come and get, and then we were, Prabhupada wanted us to hear. It was very, and we were thinking, such a merciful spiritual master. Another time, one of the things I heard was um, Bhakti Subhadamadar Marsh, who was just a young man. I don't know how old he was, but he looked like he was about 16. He was probably in his late 20s. But, um, I mean, here's Prabhupada. Sometimes Prabhupada, you, you listen to tapes in room conversations, sometimes Prabhupada would say, um, uh, should I tell you the truth or should I flatter you? And it's a perfect setup because the, what are they going to say? And then they open up the door and then, you know, Prabhupada hit them straight out. Sadhu means to cut. So, so per, this, this, it was a bunch of professors. Then it, it was the head of the religions department of, from UC, USC and so many things. And I forget the setup, but Prabhupada asked him, what do you teach? And they were all uh, religion and philosophy. And so Prabhupada said, so what is your definition of God? And the head of the USC religious department said, well, we've come, you know, that's what we're here to discuss, and we don't really know, and, and it's not the conclusion, but it's the search, you know, all that stuff they say. And Prabhupada, evidently it had been a conversation in a morning walk, so Bhakti Subhadamaraj was cued for it. So Prabhupada said to him, uh, he says that he's teaching about God, but he does not know who is God. What do we call that? And Bhakti Subhadamaraj, you know, in those young innocent days said, oh, we say that's a cheater. We say that's a cheater, Prabhupada. <laughs> now, nobody would ever say this to these people. And then Prabhupada positioned himself as the middleman. Prabhupada said, my disciple says, if you say that you're teaching something, but you do not know, you're a cheater. It was, and then Prabhupada took the conversation from there. It was so blissful. This is off the track, as I, w I wanted to tell LA stories, but they've cut me down to 15 minutes. So I was in Detroit. And uh, Deva Sadan Mandir, Prabhupada had just moved in there. And just because it just came to my mind, and it's a sweet story. Um, this one Indian gentleman said, Oh, Swamiji, Swamiji, can you read my palm? And Prabhupada said, You know, we don't do that. You know, Yokesh Mam Vahami Hum, that we depend on Krishna. Uh, you know, Prabhupada explained, so, Prabhupada said it kills the innocent, the childlike innocence of bhakti. You know, we, you know, we simply depend, like, the, you know, Prabhupada explained, the coward boys went into the mouth of Agasura, they were completely surrendered. So Prabhupada explained to him what pure devotional service was, uh, like that. And when Prabhupada finished, the man said, yes, yes, Swamiji, but can you read my palm? <laughs> so Prabhupada 
said, give me your hand. And, you know, expert theatrics, like Prabhupada said, once he played a Dwight the Chari in a play, and when the play ended, the audience was quiet. Prabhupada was wondering, why aren't they applauding? But everyone was crying. It was so moving. Of course, it's a Bengali crowd, but it was so moving, you know, they were naturally emotional. So in the same way, Prabhupada was expert at theatrics. Prabhupada said, give me your hand. And then Prabhupada clicked on his desk lamp, and he took the man's hand. You know how they do this. Mm -hmm. And we were thinking, hey, Prabhupada's reading palms. I'm queuing up, you know. I'll be next, you know. So, mm -hmm. And then Prabhupada went, all bad. <laughs> Prabhupada said, birth, death, disease, and old age. And he was so heavy, I thought the man was going to have a heart attack. It was like, you know. And then the whole mood changed. Prabhupada smiled and Prabhupada said, but clap your hands at Kirtan, all the lines go away. So pure bhakti, you know. The Prabhupada would, was staying upstairs, just like his rooms are there. And books would arrive, and usually it was Back to Godhead magazine, and usually they arrived just before breakfast prasadam. And you know, we were young men and young ladies. Actually, the men were doing it. Um, we would unload the truck. And you know, we were super hungry. We would all line up, create a chain. And I think the book room was back here where the deity rooms are. So, Pujari stuff. So we would unload all these books. So a truck pulled up, sure enough, you know, uh, before breakfast or whatever. And we all queued up. And we were used to the usual, it was Back to Godhead magazine. And Karunder got on top of the truck and he crowbarred open one of the cases, moved away the straw and pulled out the Krishna book. Krishna book had just arrived. And Prabhupada, you know, the devotees all started to cheer. And Prabhupada, there was a little window here. And Prabhupada came to this, you know, if you go outside and look at the steps, above the steps, above the door, there's a window, used to be. And Prabhupada was there and he was in his gumsha. And Prabhupada was so enlivened to see the devotees cheering in the receipt of the Krishna book, he began to play madanga on his stomach because he was just in his gum, gumsha, you know. It's very, I've never seen Prabhupada had that blissful little Brahmin belly. So Prabhupada was chanting very nicely. And so instead of Gita class, Prabhupada had been giving a class in the evening. He started reading from Krishna book. And he would offer asides. He would add to the Krishna book. Like he was explaining when Narada Muni appears before Kamsa and explains, you know, okay, it's the eighth sun, but you don't know which one is the eighth sun. And Prabhupada said, Narada Muni counted like this. You know, counting to eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this is the eighth sun. But Prabhupada said, this Vishnu is very, very tricky. What if you count one, two, three, four, five, six? Then the first becomes the eighth. What if you start in the middle? Prabhupada showed by counting any one of the suns could be the eighth sun, depending on your count, because this Vishnu is very tricky. So he used to add details like that. He also added... Anyway... Um, I'll cut some of that out. But after describing, all right, I'll say it. He, you know, there's that section when there's the rasa dance and Radharani's not given special attention. So she leaves the rasa dance and then later on Krishna goes to find her. And then the, in the Krishna book, the storyline kind of skips. All of a sudden the gopis are there and they're with Radharani. They found her and they're consoling. Prabhupada, Put in that segment. Prabhupada said that Radharani, of course, is completely surrendered to Krishna. So as they were walking in the forest, she was feeling, of course, it's all Ras, it's all Leela and far beyond our pay grade and transcendental. So she was feeling a little proud, Radharani, that Krishna's you know, left me for all the other gopis. Knowing this, Krishna said, Why don't you ride on my shoulders? So you know, these sticks and stones path of Vrindavan, you're barefoot, you just get on my shoulders. So Radharani got on Krishna's shoulders and just she was thinking that, you know, Madan Mohan Mohini, that here's Madan Mohan, yet she's, he's completely controlled by me. So Krishna said to her, there was a vine hanging over the path and Krishna said, this is Prabhupada's narration, Krishna said, why don't you hold from that branch and just swing, it'll be a nice swing. So, you know, Radharani's completely surrendered to Krishna, she's holding, and Krishna walked out and left her hanging. She was, and that's how the gopis found Srimati Radharani hanging like this. So Prabhupada would add these details. 
And one time when Prabhupada, because the temple room was over here, Prabhupada was leaving. Prabhupada got off the Vyasasana and he was walking out of his door. You know, the, he, there was a door here that went up to his room. And, you know, we were just like stunned. And Prabhupada stopped, looked at us, you know, at the devotees and said, yes, if I told you everything, you would faint. <laughs> so in that mood, a Prabhupada used to come. It, it, it was some period there, I forget exactly when. Instead of Bhagavatam class in the morning, he started teaching us the verses from Sri Shupanishad. Remember that? Om Pranamada, you know? So we were used to that. We would, Prabhupada would come, greet the deities, take Charnamrita. Then he would finish offering the the Jagannath, maybe the Charnamrita was over, I forget, and he would come and sit down. When Prabhupada sat on the Vyasasana, we would all offer all our obeisances. And we were used to, even before we'd finished offering our, you know, Prabhupada's Pranam Mantra, we would hear Prabhupada's voice, that oceanic voice of the ages, you know, would come roll, Om Pranam, Prabhupada would come rolling out. This particular day, we offered our obeisances, we were used to hearing that sound, no sound from Srila Prabhupada. And we looked up, and Prabhupada was sitting very, very straight, and tears were pouring down his cheek. I mean, his cheeks were wet from tears pouring and he was stunned. And he was looking at the, we didn't have big Rukmini, we had uh, uh, the small Utsavdi, small Rukmini Dwarkanath. And Prabhupada was looking at them with intense, you know, focus, like laser focus, and shedding tears. And then we saw Prabhupada. Everyone in the room saw it. He took a deep breath and he just suppressed it. He just pushed it down. And you know, when Daruka is fanning Krishna, Krishna's servant, and he feels ecstasy and it gets, he curses those symptoms of ecstasy because they get in the way of his service to, his, to Krishna. And in the same way, we could tell that pro this ecstasy, you know, people talk about, oh, you know, Radha and Krishna and, you know, Radha Kund and they're crying and this, okay, fine, whatever. But Prabhupada was on that highest level of ecstasy, looking at the Radha Krishna deities, shedding tears of ecstasy. And to him it was a disturbance. It was a side issue. He just pushed it aside because his duty was to train his disciples on behalf of his spiritual master how to spread Krishna consciousness. So it was profound to see that Prabhupada was on such a higher level than these, you know, chasing after Radha and Krishna in Vrindavan. When Prabhupada showed up, he would come back from his morning walk and he'd been traveling and then he came back. And I was one of the gardeners. I think maybe I, whatever, I was the gardener. And there used to be roses and grass out in front of here, although this is much nicer actually. And we had this hippie, nonviolent idea that you don't mow the lawn. That like when you, you, know, you cut it, you know, and you just let it go with the flow or whatever, you know. So it was looking a little seedy out in front. We thought, oh, it's, you know, organic or, you know, whatever. It's, you know, it's Krishna, you know, whatever. And Prabhupada pulled up, got out of his car after coming from the airport, looked and said, why aren't you, you know, what is this? Why isn't the lawn being kept clean? And Dayan, I think uh, Dayananda was the temple president. And he gave some explanation that, well, the weather and this, and it's hot and, you know, Prabhupada was, you know, transcendental Sherlock Holmes, didn't buy it at all. These used to all be private homes. Of an, he said, all their lawns are nice. In other words, they can, what, what are you feeding me this line? It's obvious that, you know, they're... And Prabhupada said something very sublime, or very practical. Prabhupada said, you have to make the cover of the book nice, or people will not read the book. So we need to keep the temples nice. We should look nice. Otherwise, the, the, P, Prabhupada said, in the age of Kali, people are superficial. Previously, people wore, wore torn clothing if it was clean, like, like you know, Sanatana Goswami when he gave up all of his clothing. People respected that, but now they don't. So things should be neat and clean and attractive. So that was Prabhupada's mantra. You have to make the cover nice or they won't read the book. We used to, along in that vein, and I'm almost done, along in that vein, whatever clothes, there was a clothing barrel for the Brahmacharya Ashram. Nobody had private clothing. You just wore whatever was, you know, if you got back late and there was no mediums, you know, you wore a s small or a large, I mean, we looked like clowns from a circus. And, you know, what to speak of matching socks, I mean, that was not even on the, you know, radar. 
So we used to chant, I think it was Diamond Gyms. I forget where it was downtown, but it was somewhere downtown. And somebody took a photograph of the, and there was, you know, Vishnu John and probably 35, 40 devotees, yeah, at least, chanting. And we sent the picture to Srila Prabhupada. Prabhupada wrote back, it just, it's classic Prabhupada, so sweet, so sublime, yet training his disciples. So in the beginning, Prabhupada praised the letter, you know, he said, you know, your servants of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, thank you so much for delivering the Holy Name. Very nice, encouraging letter. And then with his own hand, there was a P.S. at the end. It said, P.S., I understand that you're renounced, but for my sake, please dress nicely. And we went back and looked at the pictures. Oh, oh, right. He's got a point there, you know. So, should I stop? Okay. So, to be continued elsewhere. And there is more. Thank you very much, Hare Krishna.